It's casual, not formal. It's hosted by Rory Pendlin. Oh, and Renee in tow. It's time to start the show. One, two, three, go! <laughs> Everybody, welcome to another episode of It's Casual. This is actually show number 65, and it's a it's gonna be a great show, wonderful show. Renee, are you there? Yes, I'm so excited for today. Yes. This is a long time coming. We have Mudcat, the legendary blues musician. He is in the house. So right now, this is the house of blues. I've I'm wanted to get him on the show since we started. So I'm so glad we finally uh, we reached out to him. We got him to answer. And he's coming on the show tonight. He's such a wonderful, talented human being. Um, and uh, I'm going to do something I've never done on the show here before. I'm going to let him perform a few songs before we even start asking questions. Wow, this is the only time we've ever done this, but he's a legend. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. I know everybody in the audience wants a little Mudcat. So Mudcat, come on up and play a few songs for us, and then we'll start to dig in deep with some questions. Here we go. Let's, Let's do it. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Just being casual, not even wearing shoes. You come to my house, you don't find me around. You know I'm summer, baby, just shake it on down. Hear me, all the Hear me, just shake them on down. Well, hear me, Holly, mama, yeah. Hear me, I shake them on down. Well, 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 well. Yeah, baby. Now put your knees together, let your backbone move. Ain't a woman around here who can shake it like you. Hear me holler. Oh, hear me, I'll shake them on down. Well, must I holler, mama? Hey, hey. Hear me, I'll shake them on down. Well, 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 well. Georgia, I'm here to tell Georgie women they are sweet as hell, oh baby. Oh, hear me, I'll shake them all down. Where must I holler, mama? Yeah, yeah. Hear me, I'll shake them all down. Yeah, baby. Shake them on down. Song Book of White recorded way back in the 20s. Buka. Yeah. Here's an old Mudcat song. I was a weak 
naked child. My papa said to me, Son, I know your mind is wild. One slip or two will set you free. Yeah, be aware, son, the devil is real. She called to you, but she's a liar. Yeah, be aware, son, the devil is real. You fall for her and feel her fire. Once had been God's favorite. The brightest light in the sky. Woo! Till she got to bragging, man, and you telling dirty lies. Beautiful deceiver. All oh, she wanted your soul. You begin to believe her. Hey, she pull you down in a hole. Well, I'll be aware, son, the devil is real. You fall for her and feel her fire. Yeah, be aware, son, the devil is real. You call you and hear her slumber will I remember this beautiful dream when I wake from this slumber will I remember this beautiful dream I've been dancing in the sky on backs of angels softly spinning this beautiful dream Softly spinning this beautiful dream And your love is my religion Let us pray, oh Lord, let us pray religion let us pray oh lord let us pray <laughs> all right very good awesome awesome so 
Uh, first question uh, I have to ask you is where do you hail from? Where do you come from, Mud Cow? <laughs> I was born in uh, in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. We lived at 666 Cherry Street, right above the Mississippi River. At the end of the street, uh, right before the river was a uh, big Indian mound, burial ground. And right below, San my wife's been there. That right below was the uh, the sand, some a bunch of caves and sandstone prehistoric caves with a bunch of petroglyphs and stuff from the Indians. Wow. When I was a little boy, I was able to we, you know, it was open and be able to go in there and and uh, explore. And of course, the teenage, the older kids, they they'd be partying and stuff, you know. <laughs> but now, now it's mostly locked up. I think some of it, they, they have tours come in and they've got it all fixed up or something. Like I, I believe that's what's going on now. This was a long time ago. I was a little boy. So you said the teens used to go in there and party, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because it's a big cliff. It's a long cliff down to the, down to the, the, ba the basin of the Mississippi River, you know, because the Mississippi River starts up there in Minnesota. Now, now you admitted that you're barefoot. Uh, <laughs> you don't have your shoes on. You said uh, I again, my I'm, I'm, I'm COVID mode. I'm wearing my Papa Bear slippers right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in your home when you were growing up, uh, did I mean what kind of music did you all listen to? Oh well, uh, my father was a, a backyard mechanic. You know, he had a garage and and uh, he liked to uh, he fixed people's cars. And he liked to restore like uh, '67 Mustangs and uh, around that that era, and uh, '56 Ford Crown Victorias. He really loved those. But uh, he was always playing the country music radio station in the, in the early '70s, late '60s, early '70s. That was uh, so, sometimes we might classify some of that as early rock and roll because it's Jerry Lee Lewis and and uh, Johnny Cash and stuff like that. Yeah, songs, rockabilly in there. Songs with stories like "Funny Face," "I Love You," stuff like that. You know, <laughs> I'll never promise I, I beg your pardon. I'll never promise you a rose. I remember yeah. that one from my house. My yeah. my father was a big country music fan as well. And again, See, back that's what I'm saying. And but then also have stories. Johnny Cash in there, so right. you get that good old rock and roll in there too. I start all my songs off this way. <laughs> they all started the same. Um, That's uh, Luke. The reason I asked that was because What's I was going to ask you what some of your influences were that they got. I mean, how would you classify yourself? Would you classify yourself strictly as a blues man? I, I mean, we get a lot of spirituality in your music as well, uh, some gospel. Uh, how would you classify yourself as a musician or performer? I'm a troubadour, man. <laughs> I try to fit to the. I That's try to fit. To the, I try to fit to the occasion, but at the same time, as it's it's, uh, I'm not really interested in a career where I got to play some stuff that I don't want to play. Mm -hmm. So it's the Venn diagram of stuff that I like and, and stuff that may be hopefully appropriate for the moment. You know, whatever it is, whether it's a big. Okay. You know, big giant stage is just, uh, you know, me and the dog and one other person on the other side of the stream, you know. Well, your, pre your preference when you do your, your you do a 12 o'clock, uh, high noon, you do your, your Depends shows. on my mood. Depends <laughs> on my mood. Sometimes I yeah. want to play some blues. Sometimes I want to play some of these new songs I've written that aren't necessarily blues, uh -huh. you know. And um, my songwriting is... Hopefully taking the evolution. Well, evolution isn't always up, so I could go ahead and say that. But it's, uh, you know, I've always written some strange songs, I guess, is with Nate Nelson. Play one of them strange songs you write, you know. <laughs> but then I also, you know, I, I, I love to play, you know. So I, I put in a lot of hours every week for many, many years. And um, a lot of songs I always make up on the spot for what what was needed once again you know so usually dancing or some people laughing or feeling about some sexy things whatever and um so then you know i have a chance to work it out 
and uh, so, th- so a lot of these songs, I guess are, I'm saying were invented to play for people live, you know, uh-huh. and, but, but, yeah, the, but yeah. I broke up my band about four years ago and uh, I really started concentrating on, I've always played solo, but uh, I took an opportunity to raise my skills up a little bit, I hope, and um, be a better solo player. Now I'm ready to form another band. Mm-hmm. But uh, but the, meanwhile, a whole lot of songs arrived, and they weren't necessarily for you know any practical reason, except for, I mean I, there is great practicality for writing itself. So you know, besides the exercise of writing, yeah. I didn't really have a practical reason to write you know to make these songs. Yeah, so, as far so as I'm interested performing. to see, but I, I have had a chance to play a few of them. Uh, for some people live and they're connected, so very good, very good. Um, so again, who are some of your favorite musicians? Uh, okay, I'll be back. Uh, <laughs> and Renee's got a question. I've got questions, <laughs> okay. I got questions. I'll cool. come back. Um, oh my goodness, um, you mean live uh, people who are alive now, or yeah, well, it could be somebody that's gone, you know, it's passed on. Could we start? Cootie Stark. I love Cootie Stark. And uh, Frank Edwards. Beverly. Beverly Watkins. Yeah. Whoops. There we go. There you go. I could, I could drive a trailer backwards, too. No, I can't do that. Here's Frank Edwards. Yeah, he's from Washington, Georgia. My very good friend. And that's Beverly Watkins. Well, I guess it has a name on it. And, uh, yeah, so these are a couple. These are some of my, my good friends. And, uh, it's good you, you say the names, though, because there's a little glare on there. There's what? There was a little glare oh, on there. Mine, Haley put some glitter on there for me. <laughs> Talking to Just some glare from the light. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Now the world's topsy-turvy. Like the Batman <laughs> show. I like Batman. The original. <laughs> Um, when did you begin using the slide, uh, when you started playing guitar? Um, that's my favorite thing. Early I on, the slide. Pretty early on, uh, um, I, uh, w- one of the first, the first blues record that I know that, that I bought, uh, that I remember was uh, called Muddy and the Wolf. And it's a compilation of two different albums, Muddy Waters and uh, uh, Howling the Wolf. They took Howling two Wolf. great albums, took a bunch of tracks off them and put them on. And I, I bought this cassette for uh, this family I was living with. I, I bought it for the father because he liked to jog. So I was like, hey, I let know he likes country music. And I didn't know, I was 17, so I was like, Hey, you know, I bought him this and he didn't care for it too much. So I listened to it and, and, and like really, woo, really moved me, you know. And uh, that, that Muddy, well, and he was playing, there's a lot, there's slide all over those recordings. And yes. uh, so I was living in Augusta at the time and Medical College of Georgia was nearby. And they had a, a at the bookstore, they had a, big vinyl collection and uh, it was a whole bunch of imports because now you can find all the stuff recorded in the twenties, thirties on up, you know, but back in the eighties, these reissues were hard to come by in America. So there, some doctor there, somebody, I don't know who, who did it, but they had all these reissues. They were cheap, man. So I had Muddy Waters and Johnny Hooker, all these guys, you know, so I just went after that stuff and, Somewhere I, on the back of an album, I, I read, you know, you could tune your guitar a certain way, you know, and play the slides. So I tried to, you know, what's there. Now it's really, you you know, how do you play slide? And you have 10 million people tell you how to do it on the, on the, I love all these kids are like, just, just there's so many kids that are just amazing these days. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to bring Renee back up because she had a few questions for you. Sounds good. 
that, that's the understatement of the century. Getting that, getting to have a conversation with Mudcat is what I was born to do. Uh, we did have, before I get into it, Charlie Thompson wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about your world and your European travels. Well, um, oh my goodness, how long ago? 30, 25 years ago, I guess. Um, I was playing a festival in Charleston the Low Country Blues Festival, and I was playing with uh, everybody but Cootie Stark that I just showed you. Uh, we were backing them up at, uh, at, 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 at one of the venues, and uh, there was a promoter that came over from Switzerland. And that, that, well, actually, he's, a, he's an English teacher in Switzerland, but he, uh, he booked this this big festival that still happens to this day called blues to bop. And it's just this huge festival and the, the banks, you know, the Swiss banks bank, uh, put the money behind it and everything. So uh, he was able to do a lot of really wonderful things, bring, bring a lot of great artists. So he, he and his buddy Edmund would come over to America uh, and check out some artists. And he, he came to this festival because it was a hundred artists in a few days in Charleston. What a beautiful place to be Charleston, South Carolina. So uh, um, when when they saw us, we had this little thing. We're just four people. We had this little thing. The bass player played a tuba. I played a banjo. We got with the washboard and a, a trumpet. So we just march in, you know, like we're doing a second line, you know. And uh, I guess that was just enough to put us over with all from all the other artists. So he brought us over there, and he also saw that we could back up. Uh, Norman Hewitt was his name, and he saw that we uh, could back up all these different artists, all these uh, very unique American artists. So he brought us over there, and uh, we did our set, had a really wonderful time, and he put us in, other, in a lot of other beautiful situations. We backed up some really amazing people to, uh, that are uh, really life-changing. And I know you're like, what's going on? I, I just asked you one little question. Um, but it was at this festival, the Blues to Bop Festival in Switzerland, right, right, uh, forty minutes from Milan, right in there in the Swiss Alps in a beautiful lake. Uh, um, that some local people were like, "Hey, you know, there's this other stuff going on, and uh, you know, there's some other opportunities. You know, the festivals and clubs and everything. If you ever want to come, so we started doing grassroots. You know, staying with people." And uh, it, it, being an American and playing this major festival just opened doors. You know, that's, that's all people had to say. They weren't promoters. They were like, hey, you know, they'd find out who was booking the festival and say, hey, this, this American group. Oh, well, they already got points now. This American group, you know, played blues to Bob. Oh, whew, yeah, all right. Well, you know, and then we'd have these full tours and, and every time we go over, make more uh, connections and, uh, eventually expanded, so we were based in 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 that that city. Lugano is what the name of the city is. Based in little villages of, of, above there uh, in the mountains, and we we tour from there through Italy, and uh, then we come up through France, and uh, we also we base ourselves in in Paris, and we go places like Luxembourg or Brussels, whatever from there. And uh, for a good while, the air air airfare was like five was four hundred bucks. So I was able to bring my band over there. But then eventually, I just had to build. You know, I had built a band in the south and built a band in the north. We tour from there, and I'd bring like Joe Burton and trombonist or whatever. Well, how what um, I wanted to. So ask we did that for, for many years. That's awesome. I mean, those experiences are just so awesome. And how, what it, what do people, I mean, blues, two things. First of all, your type of blues reminds me of more Delta blues. I know there's like Chicago blues, you know, Elmore James, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. For me, I, when I hear your music, especially with the slide and everything, I'm, I'm feeling Delta murky, swampy. Um, what do Europeans think of that uniquely American music? I mean, you're growing up on the banks of the river you, it's a distinctly american thing but europeans love it what do you think they do you, what do they get out of it is it the same thing that you're getting out of it being a, a native 
Hmm. I I imagine they're getting that uh that unquantifiable <laughs> thing that that we get, whatever it is yeah. that, that yeah. spark that the the real the the uh the the passion the direct passion the uh the the primalness of it you know like you say you hear delta in what i'm doing and for me that that means it's more primal than a lot of stuff that's been dressed up a little bit more yes sir. you know yes, sir. and um i i get i imagine that's what people feel and um and then Americans have a certain swagger, you know, and they somehow they appreciate that 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 old that that uh, uh that uh um oh my goodness, I'm sorry, the word is uh, the, the confidence. Uh, confidence. Yes, the confidence, and um, for in Italy they have the Tarantella, and to me that's the same. You know, it's on the one instead of the two, but it's that same passion and, and direct and it's malleable, quite malleable, too. You know, it's such folk music and prime, back to the primality. It, it, so uh, you can change it for the occasion or you can uh, add an extra verse, add an extra couple measures, whatever is necessary. And I, I really think that, that people appreciate that. And it, it's there's a similar feeling in all the folk music in around from all around the world you know and america is uh truly a melting pot culturally you know and so what we do is has been brought in from all kind of cultures you know a lot of the beat of this blues a lot of american music the beat actually comes from you know the american ind indigenous people you know uh, we have um melodies and rhythms from Africa, we have the Great Britain, we have the British Isles, I'm saying, all through Europe, and we have uh, Eurasia and Asia, we have Pacific Island, we have a slide, you know, so it, maybe that's why people all around the world love it, because it, it, it is, it's world music, you know, and, um, and we're not like, oh, we're all worldly, let's play it, we're like, it's our music, man. It'll give me some old beer, you know. <laughs> so it's a real thing for us. It's a, real, it's a real thing for us. This world thing, we're living it, you know. Wow, and that's, that was like the most. Hey, that was such a colorful answer. I, I mean, what came me while I was speaking? But uh, you know, this is not a typical situation. I remember years ago we were at some real cool art party where there was all these great artists and there was music happening all the time and we were booked to play some stuff and it was really cool and we're sitting by the fire pass around guitar later on and some grappa and uh and this is switzerland and this guy comes and sits down next to me like deliberately you know everybody's like this and i'm like dude man this is peace and love this is dude this is what mankind this is evolution dude and, you know s s social evolution yeah this guy sits down next to me. He's got the long hair. Everybody's got this hippie looking stuff, you know. And uh, he goes, yeah, you know, I love American culture. I don't like Americans. <laughs> so I was like, you know, I'm whiskey drinker. So I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, all right. Well, fuck off. <laughs> but that was... Totally untypical, about, about but comics, that guy, I do appreciate that guy's honesty. He he <laughs> said, I don't like Americans, I don't, but I love the culture. So let's throw that in there, <laughs> whatever like that music, means. But, <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've heard people, uh, Eddie Bro was was on the show a few, few weeks ago, and he said basically the same thing, that when you go to uh, England to do comedy, a lot of the comics... Um, uh, feel that uh, the Americans don't want to mix or be part, you know, they won't hang out after the show, that kind of thing. So they get a kind of a bad rep. And and again, Eddie goes there and, you know, he's all about, you know, meeting new people and, and being friendly and all. So again, we just have to be emissaries when we go to other countries 
you know, so that they don't get, we don't get a bad rep in that, in that respect. You know, we need to be cordial when, when we go to those places. When in yeah, Rome, we should be the Romans do. That really surprised me about uh, the, the American comedians don't like to talk. That, uh, evidently, that's, that's, a big case, that's a big problem over there is that, they, yeah, they just don't want to hang out with the British comics, uh, you know, when they do the shows. I, you so know, I haven't this played in before. England. I haven't, I haven't played in the English, another English, no, I played Canada. I guess that's English. Eh? <laughs> eh? But, uh, <laughs> wow, that's strange, you know, because I guess we play a lot of the romance countries, you know, that's, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. You know, you you arrive in Italy. They're like, "All right, you got to be here at five o'clock, and we're gonna play at six, You know, and then you get lost on the highway, and you get there at like five to six, and you got to carry all the stuff in the places everybody's trying to eat and everything like that. And you're like, "Hey!" And then your manager or you or the leader of the band goes up, "Hey, you know, uh, don't worry, we can do this." I'm so sorry. We're like, and they're like, "Hey, put it down, drink some wine." It's like, okay, and you're like, okay, let's do it. No, no, relax, eat, 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 mud your mud your. And you're like, okay, and then you finally get in the relax. Like, oh, yeah. Like, okay, make sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, when we go to other countries, we, we become more worldly because we see how those people live. We, we get that, uh, that other half. And, but we also have to remember that we are emissaries from where we come from, too. So we have to, you know, we have to kind of, you know, like I said before, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. There's a reason that that saying is out there. <laughs> you know? Yeah, definitely. And in, in, in Asia, they say that's giving face. If you if you hang with us and you drink with us and you you have fun with us, then we're going to love you forever. You know. But if you okay. come and do your show and then you just take off, you know. I think you do a better show too. You know, you get in with the people. I think you do a better show. You know, because yeah. because yeah. the people yeah. that come up to you, they, they, they're trying to show you appreciation. They, the people that come up to you are trying to show you hospitality. You know, the people invited you are trying to show you hospitality and they're trying to give you something. So if you accept that, you know, that makes them really pleased. And then it raises it makes you want to do the you know, you already want to do a good job. And now you really want to, you know. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. Maybe there's some of these comedians went into some of these places I play in America sometimes where. But they like, yeah, use the servants' entrance, you know. <laughs> now, I, I, I gotta, I gotta show this. I gotta show this. In hospitality is, um, especially with, who? especially with the artist, you know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Maquette, can you see the um, the photo I have yeah. on there? Can you That's tell Taj us Mahal. about this? It's Taj Mahal. I see him on the. Uh, I see him on the playbill behind your head too. He's a big, big, big. I mean, I'm a huge fan of his and Kibmo. And I, how did you tell me about your relationship with Taj Mahal? What he means to you? I mean, he's obviously one of the greatest legends of all time, and uh, that's what you are, you're inheriting that place. I mean, you're definitely uh, in his league. <laughs> I'm so, be I mean, great. I like, but well, he is okay. unique. So tell me about t Taj. Yeah. Well, um, I was I was going to school in New York in uh, 1986, I guess, and uh, one of my fellow students who lived there in New York, uh, his mother was an opera teacher. That's just uh, and uh, he he got these tickets to see Taj Mahal at the Bottom Line in uh, in the Village. And that's a really beautiful, that's a really cool little club down there. But it's real small, so they had to do two shows, you know, to, to accommodate everybody. And he couldn't make it. I can't remember why. But uh, I ended up going to the show, and the the opening act was a klezmer band. And I had never heard the word klezmer, and it wasn't written anywhere. It was only later on that I understood, because I went around for years going, there was this Jewish wedding band that opened up before this guy, man. <laughs> And uh, but it was really it just blew my mind. All these guys in suits, you know, playing. It was like, what the? F oh man, this is awesome. You know, I was living in Hell's Kitchen, so I was down there, and and you know, Taj Mahal went up there and he played all by himself, and he hardly played anything. Sometimes he was just going. He, he was just like, <laughs> but it was like mesmerizing and he was singing and putting on it was it's just 
I had never heard anything like this. And uh, then they, they want to clear the place out. And I was sitting right up front. The table was right up to the stage. And I grabbed onto, I literally, I grabbed onto the table. I, I said, I'm not going anywhere. And they let me stay. <laughs> and so I, I, sat through the, I sat through it once. And uh, I don't know how long, about an hour's walk back to my apartment in Hell's Kitchen. And it was like, no. <laughs> it's like whoa i went home i wrote at least three songs at night before i went to bed and uh because that's what i was at the time anytime i learned something new i'd write a song so i wouldn't forget it you know and uh so uh i became a huge taj mahal fan and then uh years later you know i, I saw him a few times when he, he passed through atlanta and uh you know i just became a bigger and bigger fan and I remember people asking this before he got his Grammy. People were like, "Hey, you know, how how, what, how do you picture your career? What would you like?" And I was like, "I was like, man, I like to be, I like to have Taj Mahal's career, you know, because he play by himself or plays with a band or plays this kind of band, does whatever he wants, and you know, and he's real good at it. That's the career. That's what I want to do. And uh, so then uh, years later, I was working with this organization called Music Maker Relief Foundation, uh, founded by Tim and Denise Duffy. And the whole point of the organization is to help elderly musicians in American styles of music. And um, based in, Cal in uh, North Carolina, a lot of it is blues. And of course, it's his preference as well. Um, so working with that organization, uh, I went on the board of directors and um, Tim Duffy brought in Taj Mahal as, uh, as a, a an advisor and so Taj brought in his expertise his his he loves history he's a historian um and uh his fame <laughs> you know he brought he, he he brought a lot he brought celebrity to our cause but he, he also he he really believed in it because he inherited once again like all these all these new all this new family you know, all those people in dozens more that were, you know, at the age of his parents or so, you know, that were unknown, that had been, uh, hadn't had success or been around, you know, for whatever reason. And um, so working with uh, this organization, that's how uh, we, we did some shows together. We did a, a tour, a national tour for two years. Uh, from R.J. Reynolds, they were in trouble with cigarettes, so they wanted a positive image. So they they put tons of money in our tour, and Taj was the headliner. I remember he got a lot of uh, he got some uh, pushback. They were like, "You're taking cigarette money." It's all right. Well, I'll take Westinghouse. Come on, where is everybody? You know, come on. And uh, he was, you know, but that was a really heavy deal. On the side note, because they like they, I was the MC, so they flew me up to meet with this danger coordinator, you know, like when uh, when Union Carbide killed thousands of people, this is the guy they put in the camera in first to represent, you know. So we took a special, uh, we had a special course with him so I wouldn't, we wouldn't say the wrong things while we were on tour, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but in, in, in the end, they were like, yeah, let my can't talk about the artist. He's got that passion, but see it from the other, <laughs> too honest. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, protocol, so uh, protocol. Hall was a headline on that tour. So we go, we play places like Great American Music Hall, and it'd be filled up because of him. But it'd be all this artist. My band was starred. We back up a bunch of people. Sometimes Taj, and and it'd be you know different us and and Taj. It'd be depend on the city, you know. Did I make a whole story? Very close to what I leave out. <laughs> We did this for two years. I'm sorry, my mind goes off on tangents. Yeah, so two two national tours, <laughs> and uh, we, we so like we got to we got to travel together and go to some really great places. Taj was was our teacher and our guide. We, we go to San Francisco. We say, okay, we got to go to the wharf and we got to get this. You know, we'd be in Seattle. Okay, you got to do this. We got to do this, you know. 
wherever we were, he'd know the right thing and, and have the right. Yeah. And we learned a lot. Like uh, when you leave the hotel room, strip the sheets and the towels and put them like they're on the floor, leave a five or a 10, you know, and you'd be surprised every airport, every hotel we went into, they were like, Dodge! or they, they call them. <laughs> now they knew who he was, you know, and everybody everywhere treated him so good, you wow. know, and that was, that goes back to him being an ambassador, you know, he was a cool guy where, so everybody. Wow. And, um, yeah. Wow. So, but, How- the picture you have there was an event we did a few for a few years. It was a raising money for Music Maker Relief Foundation, where Bill Luckadoo brought us down to Costa Rica, and uh, we had a tournament. And uh, Dickie Betts and Derek Trucks and Jimmy Herring and uh, Sammy Blue, and uh, so I got we do it a week at a time, and I was required to entertain each evening you know before dinner and then afterwards so uh whoever wanted to play wanted to play you know one day maybe dickie best wants to play a bunch or a little bit or you know Derek or whoever you know so it was we did that for a few years and that was a great really great experience and uh so i got to play with tires quite a bit on on that situation too wow yeah. wow Very nice. i mean you, you've got to be changed uh, i've heard him speak at his cons he's a very like you said he's a he's he's an historian He's a brilliant man. He's a genius. He's an Very, intellectual for sure. He's an intellect, like he could have be a professor, you know. That's oh, yeah. what I feel about him is a oh, professorial yeah. scholar mind. And that's how I feel about you. What is it like <laughs> to uh, talk with him? I mean, did, did you guys do philosophy stuff behind stage? Like as you're waiting, you're spending a lot of time together. What did Taj Mahal and Mudcat talk about while you're waiting? For sound check, <laughs> you know. Well, I'll I tell you. Know that. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to remember those moments. You know, I had a lot of responsibilities being the MC, so everybody was coming to me about wanting to do. You know, all the way from the artists to the yeah. to the people running the club. I had a lot of stuff going, but I do remember. Uh, we played one time. My band played, and we went off stage, and we we're like. Man, we really tried, but we really sucked, and all of us felt that way. And Taj came up, came backstage. He was like, "Oh wow, you guys are on fire!" He's like, "What?" He's like, "Yeah, well, it's like that sometimes, you know. You feel like you, but it, it was great." And one time I was there all alone, and he came in. And he goes, "I got this song, Rattlesnake, which was kind of my signature because it's got this special beat or whatever." And I was playing it, and he comes back there. Hey, I like that. But check this out. Here's something for you. And he played it in, in this. And but I was just like, <gasps> so I never did learn it because I was just so awestruck. Because then I had to go do something else. But uh, I guess what I'm trying to say, I've always been st- even when I, anytime I see him, I'll still be starstruck. But yeah. on the fishing tournament, on the fishing tournament, you, you know what I'm fixing to talk about. All right. Well, if you're gonna laugh, then I should try to tell a funny part of it. Um, well, uh, Sammy Blue and I were uh, roommates. For the week over at Bill Luckadoo's house, it was right on the beach, you know. And well, it's just a spit of land, so you're never far from the beach. A uh, little fishing village, Zancudo. And um, so Sammy Blues tell me a lot about the old 70s blues and hanging out in muddy waters and stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of philosophy about uh, blues being black music and, and, and stuff like this. And, and um, but good thing, you know, uh, really good meeting. I don't know why I'm going off on this, but uh, uh, that night, Taj Mahal's uh, partner for the next day canceled, right? So they conspired without me, because I'm not a fisherman, you know, but they conspired without me. They were like, all right, well, uh, Mudcat's going to be your uh, Taj's part- fishing partner tomorrow, you know? But me, I'm drinking. I, you know, when I arrived, I was like, hey, you know, what's the local drink? They're like, rum? Cool. With what? with limon, you know, so all right, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good at two o'clock in the morning, you know, and they're like, hey, you know, uh, somebody comes up and said, hey, you know, you're going to fish with Taj tomorrow, I said, ah, they said, no, for real, so that's in uh, 4.30, you got to get up, you know, <laughs> so, all right, um, so uh, the way that, that Sammy Blue put, no, the way Taj put it was, uh, 
Cause bang, bang, bang that morning. Bang, bang, bang. Mud cat, get up. We're going fishing. Bang, 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 bang. Mud cat, get up. Get your ass up. <laughs> the door, wham, the light comes in. <laughs> so Ty said he picked me up by the scrub, you know, <laughs> and carried me out to the dock. And I was, I was kind of blue. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you have to go, there's this gulf that you have to go through. Then you go out to the deep, deep water. And since I didn't have any experience as a fisherman, you know, of that side, you know, deep sea fisherman, uh, they again conspired without even talking with me. And they, uh, they hooked a marlin, no, a sailfish. It wasn't a marlin, but it was a sailfish. Oh, wow. And, uh, then handed it to me to reel it in, like so I caught it, you know. So I did. <laughs> and I, they told me what to do. You know, Taj was like he he was, he was really he he was able to teach me instantly, like about the breathing and the the how much drag and I somehow it was just as if he was like telling me how to play a song or something. It was just boom like that. So I brought it in, and it, it horrified me. There's this beautiful animal. There's no reason to do this because it wasn't fun for me. You know, I don't understand how people go ahead. I ain't criticizing, but I don't understand it. You know, so the, I remember the, 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 it was up there and they had the big old eyes looking at me and it was like, and I like, it was, why? And I must have had this like, oh, horrified look on my face because like Taj, who was always stoked, he's like, oh, he'll be all right. Don't worry. He'll be all right. <laughs> So they, they put him back, back in the water. We put him back in the water. We went way out, uh, like thirty miles or something like that. And uh, we caught some. What we were, what we were hunting was uh, fish that we could eat, which is my my and uh, some tuna. So I caught a big old tuna, and you know, better believe we ate, I ate that. <laughs> you know, yeah, everybody. tuna, red yeah. snapper. Yeah. Oh man, that is so, so awesome. Uh, so we, yeah, we had a great day fishing, and Todd said it was one of his uh, favorite days of fishing, which really shocked me. So, and anytime you see him, uh, and that's been 20 years now, almost 15 years, anytime you see him, he's got this gold marlin around his neck. Look, yeah. look for it. Look I've, for it. I've seen it. I've saw he got, because uh, of the fishing tournaments, we they'd give like the the biggest marlin or the the sportsman, you know. So I guess he got biggest marlin that year. I think it was. So he he still wears that. <laughs> His gold. Wow! Wow! But because you weren't supposed to be there. <laughs> And he had to teach you, and you had the experience with the fish. That was his best Ooh. time. Yeah. <laughs> I did. Have, we did have, I don't remember what we talked about, but we did. You know, it was too. It was. You know, he was. He was kind of. He was very patronly. You know, <laughs> that moment I felt. And uh, yeah. I don't know. If and then um... back to the place and go play with Dickie Betts. You know, he want Mudcat played it, sang it. You know, because he didn't want to sing so much. He wanted to play. You know, Dickie. So it was like, all right. And Derek Trucks don't sing, and Jimmy Herring doesn't sing. So I got and Sammy Blue and I got to sing a lot. <laughs> I, I did find. I did find. Uh, real quick here, let me show y'all. This is him doing fishing blues, but uh, that is that Marlin. <laughs> That is that Marlin. I don't know if y'all can see it in there, but he is yeah. wearing it. That's uh, yeah. wearing the Marlin. I can yeah. see it. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to show that because I have I have seen him do it. And now I want to go to um I want to show I want to show something here that means a lot to me and I know it means a lot to you, Mudcat. Let's talk a little bit cuz this changed my life and I know it changed yours. Yeah. Talk a little bit about these two guys. <laughs> Let's talk about Jake and Elwood. Uh yeah um let's see they 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 did a lot to bring blues and r and b music into back into popular culture when it it already faded and um brought attention to a lot of great great artists and um introduced me to to uh John Lee Hooker, you know. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. How, the, how, 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 how? <laughs> yeah, it was, it, there's a scene where he's sitting out in front of the chicken place on Maxwell Street, 
and it's Muddy Waters band that's backing him up, including Willie Big Eyes Smith and uh, uh, Pine Top Perkins. I and uh, and I had a I had a cassette, you know, one of those little flat cassette. So I'd tape the radio or tape whatever I like, and I was taping a lot off of this show. Maybe we rented some. I don't know, but anyway, it's very short. It's a very short moment where they show him in front of the because the whole scene is they're going to the chicken place to go see Aretha Franklin and Mac yeah. Guitar Murphy, and but sitting out front is John Lee Hooker going boom, 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 how, 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 and I was like, what the? That's what that's not that? even. That's that's that, what what is that? What what is that? I love it. What is it? I don't understand. And but I didn't even have the whole song. So that what the fuck's what? How 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 how? A boom boom. Yay! Hey! Whoa! Whoa! My God! Yeah. So that 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 definitely changed my life. That changed my life too because I had never heard. I don't even know if that's singing. I hear that and I say, <laughs> what is that? What is that growl that he's doing and that swagger and that sexy smile that he's so confident, you know? It's it's incredible. And then, of course, like you said, then they go... I'm going to use you for my purposes. I'm going to use you for my own purposes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's it. So, so you saw that and that was before you... Did you see the Blues Brothers before or after you started experimenting with guitar and all of that? Where was that on your journey? Uh, I saw Blues Brothers. I was 11, so I didn't start guitar till I was 17, I guess. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so yeah. before, so, so you bring that different. in. So Blues, Blues Brothers yeah. is 1977, I think. Is it? Yes. Yeah, so I, I would have been 11 be years old. That, yeah. Maybe 80. Maybe 12, 80. I think it's 80. Like yeah. yeah, might be there. Mm -hmm. It's around that time. Yeah, yeah, 13, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, I th and, they're, and also them being white, actually meant something to me of course most of the cast was was black but to me that invited me into being able to appreciate you know because i saw it when i was about your age or, or or younger maybe five or six and it was my favorite movie and that the, the way they integrated every person of, of different races everybody was playing music together nobody was an outsider i felt included in my blues journey and, and what i could listen to and it was just a huge and everybody who was anybody was in that movie I mean, anyone who was famous in 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 seventy nine yeah. or eighty or whatever was in that movie. It's just incredible. Well, think about the joy that those guys had because they were able to. They they this was an opportunity to you know John Belushi loved to sing you know yeah. and yeah. and they had, what an amazing band they had for Saturday Night Live already and right. yeah. but this so what an opportunity to be able to bring all you know Doug Dunn and Steve Cropper all these amazing musicians into the situation. It's like one excuse this this skit <laughs> gave us an excuse yeah. to bring in these, these uh, maestros, you know, these these right. king these kings and queens, you know, in here and present them to you know uh, live uh, on live TV where the mo the biggest audiences are watching, you know. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. imagine the story that they had of been able to do that, you know, and then it comes yeah. over and they do it again, you know, bring, make a movie and stuff, you know. Right. Well, and like you said, help out, uh, you know, the performing, the performers, the artists that had recorded these original songs um, with, you know, that had kind of, um, it had kind of faded by that time, like you said. But it, getting older. Blues Brothers helped to bring that back. Kids got to be on the radio. <laughs> got to be a kid to be on the radio, man. <laughs> Oh, that reminds me. I did want to ask. I know we're getting short on time, but I wanted to ask about that. You know, because uh, Taj and or whatever. You know, obviously he's uh, a mature man and and all of that. And my point is, the blues is. I feel that the blues is something that, as you age in blues, it's almost like you get more credit or you get more credence. It's not the same. You know, in pop music, I think sometimes we idolize the youth. We idol. But it's almost like there's something about a blues musician being older gets even more respect because there's something about the person's soul that's in that blues music. Is that true? It is accepted to be. It is accepted to be older. Uh, on the other hand, there's like a great fascination with children who can play. Like mm -hmm. there's a great fascination with it. Every once in a while, it works out. You know, uh, Sean Costello. 
Derek Trucks. Uh, there's plenty more. Every once in a while it works out, but there's great fascination with that. And there's a greater fascination. I think Rolling Stone put this, this story out that talks all about it, about um, the, the rocking side of the blues, you know, the, the million mile an hour guitar shredders, you know, uh, that's, that's a really huge, you know, and that's a youth, that's a young thing, you know, I mean, they, of course, Buddy Guy invented it and they all like, everybody wants to get on stage and have a picture with Buddy Guy with them doing it, you know, um, and I'm going to say there's, there's a thing. There's this weird thing about uh, ladies with stilettos and real short skirts that, that, that you know, is, is giant popular, too. So I don't fit in any of those categories. But, <laughs> but I still, I, but in the genre, you know, is why, it, you know, it depends on how the, the receiver, how open the receiver is. Um, that, that, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm, supposed to be able to play blues or America or this cut this folk music until I'm the day I die you know and yeah you age into it and get better at it you know like a but at line. the same time there's you know a lot of the jobs and the desire you know is is for this rock and roll stuff you know now I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna sum this up a little bit uh, when you do your shows um, you play some piano, you play some guitar. Um, it's, it's fun to watch. You, you involve your wife in, in some of the shows. You, sometimes your pets walk into the shows. <laughs> Obviously, you have a very loving home um, with a lot of support for what you do, and that's wonderful. Just um, feed everybody snacks. <laughs> also, Renee, uh, didn't we have another uh, uh, performer who uh, had a video that he wanted Mudcat to see. <laughs> yes, we do. I'm going to play it for you right now. Here okay. You hey, Usually we play these at the top of the hour. Know, I know you're going to have a good show tonight because you got Mudcat on. <laughs> and I'm telling you, that cat is the baddest. Man, he knows what he's doing. I love when he slides on that guitar. <laughs> so much love to you all. Have a great time there on It's Casual with Mr. Mudcat. Oh, man, tell him I said hello. Oh, I would love to see him again. Take care. <laughs> yeah, my old good friend, man. We we spent you know, we, we 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 spent many many hours over there on uh on uh by Jack's Brewery, you know. <laughs> well, I'd love to hear those stories next time we have you on. Um, would you like to play a song uh, to play us out today? Sure. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Renee. Mm -hmm. For everything. Yeah, for thank you, Brenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rory. Thank you, Mike, for being here. We love you. Thank you. We love you. Yeah, I can't never be satisfied, but I'll be right on. 
Yeah, go the way to leave, and I won't be a fight no more. Go back down south, and I don't even want to go well down after. I'll worry it mine. Yeah, I can't never be satisfied, but I keep right on trying. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Mike Cat. Thank you. Thank you.